The title of my sermon today is Ask for Whatever You Want. I think this is a great title, like, don't you want to have this? Like, you could ask for whatever you want, and you can get it, maybe after the end of this sermon. Um, it will be great. But <clears throat> let's focus on what uh, Solomon, uh, David's son, and also his successor, is doing here. Because it's kind of a very important event in his life, because this is what makes Solomon so great, right? Right? And I think we can learn from this text uh, what God is trying to say to us individually and as our uh, whole church and to our whole church. Uh, we've been continuing with the life and story of David, who was king. And in the few weeks before, we have seen David fall. Okay, And this is a very important part of the story of David, because it describes of him as human David. David is like us, have sins. He had to deal with it. But in the midst of all this messy things that's happening around, David still uh, acknowledged that God is present, that God is king. He makes mistakes, but he comes back to God. And Scripture is trying to tell us Life is not that easy. Even though we know what is good, you know, there is struggle in us. We are still weak. We are influenced by the world. So in our everyday uh, life, if we do not live a victorious life with the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, then we are uh, bound to fall. Um, so the story is there to say, hey, even the great David, he messed up, but God still titles him a man after God's heart. In the goods, in the bads, in the uglies, he's still trying to hold on to God, learn from his experiences, his mistakes, and know that there is nothing good that he could give. The only thing that makes him grace is that he had received God's faithfulness, God's love, God's grace, God's has said, and that makes the difference. So when we read about great men uh, among Scripture, the Scripture is very clear they all messed up. And they, the Scripture wants to tell us that it is God's grace and, 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 and their direction when things go wrong, where do they come back to? Okay? That's what makes the difference. Now we're going to Solomon, and Solomon is a great, great king. It is, uh, Israel has been the most powerful, most peaceful, most influencing uh, nation during the time of King Solomon. But if you think about it, King Solomon is very different with King David, or Solomon is different with David. For instance, David... He was a shepherd boy who became king. Solomon, he wasn't born in Bethlehem. He was born in the palace, right? He, he was royal blood from the beginning. Um, David, um, he is a warrior. He knows how to fight. And in his core belief, he knows that it's God's fight. And you see that with David and Goliath. But what about Solomon? He doesn't go out, you know, uh, leading a campaign. Uh, he's just, he's not a warrior. You don't have a, a David and Goliath story in the life of Solomon, even though he wins great wars. Um, David, he is what? He had a long wilderness experience, right? He, he was a fugitive. He was running away from Saul. And among that, he learned about God in this wilderness experience that went over a decade before he finally became king. Solomon, you don't read anything about his wilderness experience. You know, he was born with a silver spoon. You know, he grew up in the palace 
all the best learning uh, experiences he had in the palace. You know, he, he, was, he was rich. He didn't have to worry about what I'm going to eat today. Well, he probably did. He had to choose a lot, but not like a poor person. He, he just lived a life with luxury, abundance. Okay, this is Solomon. And if you think about this, he didn't have a wilderness, a true wilderness experience. David's life is characterized with you know, victory and overcoming like situations, hardships, you know, all, uh, all of it, um, you know, it's written in his wilderness experience. That's why he wrote a lot of psalms. He had to cling on to something. He had to pray. So most of the psalms are written by David. Solomon, after this incident in Gibeon, um, he became a wise man. So he becomes kind of a scholar. He's not a warrior figure. Uh, he wrote a lot of proverbs, and he wrote a lot of songs. So he, he characterizes wisdom rather than David, more of a prayer kind of life. Okay, so it's a little different. Um, David, he had a vision for building a house for the Lord, the temple. Uh, Solomon, he uh, builds it, actually. And in the process, you know, he had to have a lot of people to get involved with that, right? Um, so it's a little different. I want to go to chapter 3 to look at Solomon when he was just beginning his rule as a king. A few years passed. It was bloody. And he had to get rid of Adonijah who wanted to become king. You know, um, uh, But anyway, he became king. But think about who Solomon was. Solomon's mother is whom? Bathsheba. Okay? And we remember how David and Bathsheba, because of their uh, sin, how uh, total destruction came into the family of David. Okay? Solomon is Bathsheba's son, but not the first, because the first, after it was born, due to the adultery between these two people, God punished them, and the firstborn was unnamed and was dead. The second son, right? Uh, the son after uh, the firstborn was um, killed uh, is Solomon. We have Solomon. Okay. And Solomon, God gave a name. Okay. He, he, he gave a name through the prophet Nathan. And we have that in 2 Samuel 12, 25. Okay. This is a name that was given by God. And because the Lord loved him, he sent word through Nathan, the prophet, to name him Jedidiah. And it means the beloved of the Lord. Okay. So you see the judgment of God and also the grace and blessing and love of God that God had given to David and Bathsheba. And through Jedidiah, the beloved of God, you know, God wanted to show through the life and kingdom of King Solomon what it will be when Christ comes, the true Messiah comes. So all of the good parts of David and Solomon, it will be you know, um, represented by King Jesus, the Messiah. When he becomes king, uh, all of God's rule will be like the rule kind of, you know, represented in the reign of King Solomon. And we see where it all began. It started from, as we read chapter 3, from worship, and it ends with worship. And I think this is the key to true greatness and true maturity. Our church is celebrating our 14th anniversary. It's our 14th birthday. 
Where are we heading toward? I think our church, as we think and reflect about it, the greatest memories that we have should come from true, authentic worship, where we are in awe in the presence of the Lord. It should begin with worship, and we should end with worship. It's not about God asking to Solomon like a genie, hey, what do you want? It's not about Solomon getting what he wants. It's about worshiping the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all our mind. Because in today's worship, we see Solomon go to Gibeon. But why Gibeon? Shouldn't he worship in Jerusalem? Well, it's kind of complicated. David, he brought the ark back to Jerusalem, but the rest of the tabernacle was in Gibeon. How do I know that? It's in Scripture. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. It's written here. And Solomon and the whole assembly went to the high place at Gibeon. So you have the same story written in 2 Chronicles, and it has a more detailed uh, account of what is happening. For God's tent of meeting was there. Okay, so the, God's tent of meeting was at Gibeon which Moses, the Lord's servant, had made in the desert. Now David had brought up the ark of God from Kiriath-Jerim to the place he had prepared for it because he had pitched a tent for it in Jerusalem. Okay, If you read scripture, you know that David brought the ark back, but it's pitched in a tent, uh, but not the whole uh, tent of meeting was uh, brought. But the bronze altar that Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, had made was in Gibeon, in front of the tabernacle of the Lord. So you see the tabernacle was in Gibeon, and the altar for um, the burnt offering, the bronze altar, was in Gibeon. That's why Solomon had to go there to offer the burnt offerings. Okay. Um, so in Gibeon, you have the uh, altar, the bronze altar, and Solomon offered what? A thousand burnt offerings. Okay, a thousand burnt offerings. Um, if you read Leviticus chapter one, um, God details how he wants a, to receive a burnt offering. You know, it's very time consuming, and you have to like, basically cut off all of the meat, um, uh, the intestines, you know, everything, and then you burn everything up. You burn, like, everything up. So it's like, if you look at it, um, Solomon probably didn't offer, like, doves because he wasn't a poor person. He had to offer uh, a perfect, like, calf, a bull, right? And 10,000 of them, think about that, all burned, no meat left. It's not a fellowship offering, it's a burnt offering. Burnt offering means you burn the whole thing up. Recorded in uh, Leviticus chapter 1, the final verse, it says, it is a burnt offering. There's like a couple levels of it, but um, it's describing about Uh, when a poor person offers a burnt offering. So it's describing about a dove. Um, But in the end, a burnt offering, whether it's been offered by a rich person, somebody, uh, whatever, an offering made by fire, you burn the whole thing up, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So imagine uh, Solomon, he's offering thousands of this. I don't know if he did it on a single day. But he offered a thousand of it. A burnt offering is a voluntary offering. It is different from a sin offering and a guilt offering. So it is done through a voluntary heart. And it represents, in the New Testament age, our total dedication. So Solomon is dedicating himself, representing all of Israel, a thousand dedications. So we see him wholeheartedly dedicating himself. 
When I was reading this part, um, a person kind of popped up in my head, and I want to introduce her. And she's a missionary to Korea. Um, right after the great like revival that happened in 1907. Um, her name is Ruby Kendrick, and if you don't know, I'll just introduce her. Um, she was born January 28, 1883, and um, uh, she was born in America, uh, Plano, Texas. Uh, she graduated from Plano High School in 1903, and she was interested in pursuing missionary work uh, she attended Scarlet Bible and Training School in Kansas City, uh, Missouri, for two years. And after graduating, uh, Kendrick spent a year as a teacher of the Bible at the North Texas Training School uh, in Terrell, Texas, and also served as a pastor's assistant at the church there. Um, she spent the following year, 1906 to 1909, at Southwestern University taking additional courses to acquire additional skills for missionary work. And then in 1907, uh, the Ladies Foreign Missionary Society of the Methodist uh, Episcopal Church uh, South appointed Kendrick to serve five years in Korea, but she, didn't, uh, she wasn't able to fulfill the whole five years because right after she went, one year later, you know, um, she, got, she died of uh, appendicitis at uh, the Severance Hospital, which I was born, <laughs> in um, Seoul. Um, so it, it was kind of tragic. She was young, and when she died, her age was 25. So think about this, a young, um, single, unmarried uh, woman uh, went to Korea, and she served for about a year, and then you know, she passed away. But before, you know, um, <clears throat> the mission society uh, her heard about her death, one day before, they received a letter, okay? They received a letter. And in that letter, um, she wrote something about her heart to Korea. She said, if I had a thousand lives, Korea should have them all. And this statement is engraved on her tombstone, which is in Yanghwajin uh, in South Korea, where a lot of missionaries, uh, a, lot of, a lot of foreigners were buried. So I think this is the meaning of what Solomon was trying to do when he offered, you know, 10,000, uh, uh, 1,000 burnt offerings. He wanted to dedicate himself totally, okay? And using Kendrick's words, you know, if I had a thousand lives, you know, God, you should have them all. As our church enters our 14th year, I think this is what God wants from us. Total dedication. When does Solomon receive his wisdom? When does the nation of Israel represent the glory of God? It is when God finds a person who is ready to pour out his heart, mind, and soul and dedicate himself to the Lord. It is this total dedication that changes everything. Isn't that why God came to Solomon in a dream after he offered this as it was a pleasing aroma to the Lord, as it, as it pleased the Lord a thousand times. He appeared to Solomon and asked the question, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And we see Solomon asking for wisdom. And, and, and you have to think about um, Solomon's attitude that just equates to Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. 
In his heart, Solomon, he was thinking about God. He was thinking about the kingdom. He was thinking about why he was placed there. And he recognized that compared to David, who had his wilderness experience, who had his victories, he didn't have anything. The only thing that he could cling on to is, Lord, give me your wisdom. Give me your discernment. Give me your heart so I could tend to the people that you have given to me. And this also pleased the Lord. In verse 10 says, the Lord was pleased that Solomon has asked for this. So if you think about this, God was pleased 1,001 times, right? He was pleased by the aroma, and then you have this Solomon, what do you want? And he said, I want wisdom, discernment, so I could rule well, so I could establish your kingdom, O Lord. God was so pleased, and that's where you see the blessing. We come to church, we come to God for a lot of reasons. God, I have a family situation, I have a financial situation, my kids have some problems, and I want to, I need your guidance on this. But when do we see a total dedication to the Lord? I offer you my everything. It is at this point in our life, that when we have this encounter with God, that his vision is poured upon us. His power is given to us. And I think this is something that God is requiring of us today. When has our worship experience been a pleasing aroma to the Lord? When have our dedications, the things that we ask, be something that pleased God's heart? For seven uh, weeks, we have offered Friday night as a time and place to pray to God. I also dedicated another set time during the afternoon to dedicate myself in prayer also. Looking at today's text, I think God wants our total dedication. Like in Romans 12, Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, if you know that God has saved you, if you know that you are righteous before the Lord, if you know that all these spiritual blessings are with you, if you know that I am God, a living God, who loves you, and if you have received my has said, my faithfulness, my loving kindness, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. When I was preparing this sermon, I wanted to start off, if God would appear here and he would ask the question, What do you want? Ask of me. I will give you whatever you want. I was thinking of, you know, yeah, if God would ask that question, what would I ask? Representing our church, what would I ask? Individually, what would I ask of God? It wasn't about what I wanted. The question is actually asking. Ask of what I want. God wanted to ask this question so we know where his heart is heading toward. And I think as we celebrate our 14th anniversary birthday, as we are growing up as mission community church, as a community of believers, followers of Christ, the body of Christ, We should ask what the head of the church has in mind. And only, and only 
when we rededicate ourselves to Him, and only when we have this intimate, deep conversation with Him in prayer, can we fulfill God's glory. God is asking to each one of us, the members of MCC Church, ask, seek, knock. Ask whatever in my name, and it is given. But in that statement alone, we have to really think deep. Is my heart totally toward my God, my Savior, my Lord? Today's text started at the sacrifice in Gibeon, and then also another burnt offering and fellowship offering in Jerusalem, where the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence is. And if you really think about this, it's all about our dedication toward the Lord. And as we come to the Lord's table after my sermon, I hope it will be a time that we all rededicate ourselves as Jesus gave his whole body his blood and life for us. We should, in response to that grace and love, also respond to him with our total sacrifice, a living sacrifice, our total dedication. Let's pray.